Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our Cambridge Humanities for Victoria webinar this afternoon. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered and pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. My name is Emma Kapler and I am the Education Sales Manager here in Victoria. I also look after the inner city, Bayside and Mornington Peninsula schools in Melbourne. I'm now going to introduce you to our friendly sales team. We have Paula Kelly. Paula looks after the schools in the West and the regional areas in the West. Carolyn Chalora, who looks after the schools in the North and then the regional areas in the North. And then we have Jenny. Jenny Nelson looks after the schools in the East and the Southeast and then the regional areas in the Southeast. So I want to tell you about the presentations this afternoon. So Michael's going to present on teaching and learning history using examples from the Year 9 textbook, followed by Jennifer Casey. Jennifer's going to take us through making use of visible thinking routines in the humanities classroom. Then we're going to have Adrian Defanti. He'll be taking us through geographical concepts and skills development through the series, followed by Ashley Pratt presenting on historical conceptual development through the series. And then we'll have Ben Hoban. Ben's going to take us through the digital resources that accompany our brand new series and teaching the Holocaust in Year 10 history. All of our um, presenters this afternoon are experienced teachers. They're um, passionate about history, geography, economics and business, civics and citizenship. And I'm also delighted to say that they're authors on our new Cambridge Humanities for Victoria. I'm now going to hand you over to Michael. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Michael. So you need to start sharing yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our presentation. Uh, look, it's been my very great pleasure to be involved with the new textbook series, Cambridge Humanities for Victoria, for which I've written three chapters. As lead author, I also had the enormous pleasure of reviewing wonderful chapters by fellow authors. As an author, I draw great energy and also inspiration from the prospect that a chapter can just absolutely intrigue and engage young minds. And if it makes life easier for teachers, most of us are desperately time poor, so much the better. Writing a chapter for the classroom can be compared with stuffing a Christmas stocking with goodies. You take delight in finding more and more good things and in imagining how they're going to go across in the classroom. Uh, two of my chapters, one was uh, Industrial Revolution, the other World War I. Wonderful topics, both of them, but ones that have been intensely covered in so many books. And there is a tendency to cover the same classic aspects of each. I felt that my task was to make sure that I did cover the canonical material, but also to enliven it by seeking out new sources and fresh, unusual viewpoints. So uh, these were topics that have been intensely covered, but usually in the same manner. Uh, and I felt that I should cover the canonical material, but also enliven it by seeking out new sources and some fresh, unusual viewpoints. And I realised that before I started writing, I really needed to look for those new perspectives. And as it turned out, overseas travel helped a little bit with that. So the chapter on Industrial Revolution was quite a joy to write, but I realised that I needed to go beyond the obvious things of great inventors and great inventions, the typical nuts and bolts focus. I felt that for students who are living in what is called the fourth industrial revolution, it would be almost impossible to imagine the massive changes from an earlier agrarian life to the new life made possible when the steam engine made factory production and railway locomotion a possibility. It's so easy to give technical information about the inventions, but so much more difficult to cultivate empathy about their effects on human life and experience. I do make intensive use of images in the chapters this painting by John Lucas is much more than the usual group portrait. It's a portrait of a remarkable generation of inventors who made breathtaking leaps in technology, such as the Great Britannia Bridge behind them. To get students thinking more deeply, I said a few themes. Was the Industrial Revolution really as bad as 19th century reformers would have us believe? What were the experiences of women during this uh, era of change? And for us, what are the end implications of the Industrial Revolution in our own era of global climate change? So I come to the question, was the Industrial Revolution really as bad as it was made out to be? And of course, that is the cutting edge of current historiography. 
I use some of the social conscience paintings, such as this one by Luke Fields, to set up uh, the problem of reliability of sources. The poverty shown here in the painting really did exist, and so too did the harsh working conditions in the factories. From this large body of visual sources, it is tempting to conclude that the Industrial Revolution was indeed one of dark satanic mills. But, for example, how did women experience the era of the Industrial Revolution? The visual records of the time are actually problematic because many paintings were done for the owners of the factories, such as the one shown here in the background at Wigan by the painter Air Crow. The painter only shows us the women taking a lunch break. There's no information about the working conditions in the factory behind them, least of all the crushing long shifts. But recent research by Emma Griffin, for example, has suggested that many people and many women did benefit from a solid wage during the Industrial Revolution as compared with what they could earn in previous generations in village life. It's also important, I think, to write women's actions and agency into our chapters. This chapter pays tribute to Annie Besant, the great feminist who took on the Bryant and May matchstick factory. She defended the so-called matchstick girls who were handing phosphorus for matches, which got into their system and ate away their face so that when they chewed food, it fell out the side of their face. The chapter on the First World War also demanded fresh perspectives. It was really important to cover the essential aspects of the conflict, such as the debate over the outbreak of the war, the technical details of the terrible new weapons developed. But I did want to explore less familiar aspects of the war, such as the enormous importance of women on the home front. And I wanted to look at the controversial issue of the Anzac myth or legend. By good fortune, I found myself traveling in England. My wife and son set off for the Doctor Who trail I set off for the Imperial War Museum trail. And needless to say, the exhibition spaces were just astounding, but that wasn't what I came for. I needed to have access to the broadest and deepest collection of recent publications, hopefully containing fresh and stimulating insights into the World War. And I found them. One of the most fascinating primary sources I discovered here was the, also the most humble, the official postcard printed by the British government to inject innocuous propaganda into thousands of German of British homes. This one, by its title, talks about the glorious 1st of July, our first prisoners. That is a gaggle of about a dozen German prisoners. It is an outrageous distortion because the date refers to the catastrophic first day of the Somme, Britain's most costly military defeat. Some 20,000 men were killed mainly in the first hour at a rate of one death every 4.4 seconds. This is where the tragedy of war and of propaganda bites home. My travels also brought me to the work of Jean-Michel Girard, a French Canadian artist who does wonderful images of military figures and Cambridge, being Cambridge, tracked him down, employed him straight away and has done splendid uh, images for the whole series. This one is a stormtrooper, one of Germany's elite shock troops in World War I. Another important place for research and resources was in Paris, where Les Invalides houses not one, but five uh, distinct museums of military history, one of them devoted to the world wars. And here too, the museum craft was state of the art, but it wasn't really what I needed. It was again the bookshop. And from the bookshop, I came across one of the best analyses I've ever seen of images of propaganda, as it's called, the art of selling war. And I think as teachers, we know that the discussion of emotive wartime posters, including techniques such as the bestialization of the enemy, will allow a very rich classroom discussion. No account of war, I think, is complete without the dimension of women's history. Images of nurses and of munitions workers are common enough, but they need to be linked with this staggering volume of work that women did. In Britain, for example, women were producing 80% of weapons by 1917. And it's less well known that some 200,000 women stepped up to the plate and kept the British government and administration running during the war. Uh, here's a couple of pages from the chapter. On the left, you can see the photographs and the posters about women's munition workers. And on the right, you have one of Girard's beautiful drawn images of a nurse. And just to give you an idea of what those women worked at, here in Australia, they were working at Maribyrnong at the huge ammunition plant, and they were ha ha handling shells like this one, 
four and a half inches in diameter, an absolute huge shell from a Navy gun, so heavy that even empty, I can barely carry it properly. And that's what the women were working with. One small lapse of concentration and there would be a huge explosion, which is in fact what happened at the Marab Dong plant at one stage. I'd like to share with you one remarkable story, an inspiring story of an Australian painter, Dora Meeson. Uh, before the war, she was already a suffragette and she went to Britain to advise the British suffragettes in their campaign on the vote. But she was a modernist painter. And so people at the time during the war were very mystified when she suddenly went backwards artistically to a more traditional style of painting. And she painted a sentimental scene of a British family farewelling a soldier. They were mystified, but there was a good reason for it. Meeson was an artist, but she was also an activist and a feminist. She learned that British working women were not receiving government pensions when their husbands were killed. They were actually having to prostitute themselves just to feed their families. So she painted this work in the academic style, knowing it could be sold at a high price and distributed all the money to needy women. There's a wonderful biography of Dora Meeson by Myra Scott, just come out, inspiring reading. And there on the right is the painting we're talking about. On the left, you can see that instead of just putting a caption on the work, uh, I try to build learning exercises around images. So they become a text to be interpreted, not just a picture. Uh, one important aspect for me was to give historians and the work they do presence on the page. I wanted students to realize that historians are people and professionals, not just names on the covers of books. Uh, and one I chose was the great Bill Gamage, whose work I absolutely worship, uh, to illustrate the importance of primary sources. So there is a little collage with a soldier in the trenches writing a postcard home or a letter home, that's a primary source, and then Bill Gamage in his study writing up his wonderful book, The Broken Years. It is a comfort to me to know that somebody else has got a study as untidy as I do. And finally, I was very intrigued that our course of study asks us to engage with current debates about the issue of commemoration of war. Uh, I, I stole the title of the controversial book by Lake and Reynolds, two historians I respect massively. They wrote the book, What's Wrong with Anzac? And uh, I put my own title there. Um, and I believe that this part of the course could really stimulate some absolutely fascinating class discussions about whether commemoration is glorification of war or whether it is a respectful uh, appreciation of service. Now, before I close, I did just want to offer you something pleasant to look at in this, the most unpleasant of times. And I chose a postcard from Russia. I was in Russia in January leading an art and history tour. And I was elated to discover that Russia has a museum of Russian vodka. And I just thought that was the most wonderful thing. The restaurant inside is beautiful, but it went further. Once I went inside, I realized that this was an unparalleled museum, which allows you to drink what is on exhibition. We had a talk and then we were required to drink three shots of vodka at 90% proof. And by the way, so that you understand the protocol, women are allowed to sip, but men have to gulp. Now, I don't want it to be construed that I'm in any way approving the, the, uh, the drinking of uh, alcohol, not by any means, but as a professional historian, I must say that I have to respect the importance of primary source research. And so I made the supreme effort of sculling down the rocket fuel on the table there. And it occurs to me that when it's safe to travel again, you might like to mention perhaps to your principal that the Museum of Russian Vodka would make a wonderful staff PD. Certainly uh, it might be pricey getting there, but the answer is obvious. It would leave the, the staff in much better spirits. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to my other viewers. Thank you, Michael. That was fabulous. Um, I'm Jen Casey, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today to speak about the new Cambridge Humanities series. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the um, visible thinking routines um, that we've included throughout the series, uh, particularly in relation to the economics and business and civics and citizenship um, sections. Uh, so the thinking routines that we've included, uh, many of you will be familiar with. Um, they're from the Harvard University's Project Zero group. 
Um, I'd encourage you to, if, if you don't, if you'd like to learn more about them, um, I'd encourage you to visit the Harvard website to learn a little bit more. Um, but in short, visible learning um, or visible thinking routines are engaging classroom activities, uh, which challenge students to reflect on and articulate their thinking about a prompt or source material. Uh, which we know is the core of um, so many of our subjects. It's responding to source material. Um, it's making it about um, authentic learning experiences that have to do with the world around them um, because student outcomes uh, are so much improved when they are about real life experiences and they can see how, that, how what they're studying um, relates to real life and real world experiences, um, which is why I think it has a real... Um, democratising effect on student learning. Um, we also know that, that students learn a lot when they get to talk to each other about topics um, rather than um, us talking at them or to them, um, but when they have an opportunity to learn from each other um, as well as being able to see what they're learning, they can really take control over their, over their own learning um, and become really empowered learners. Um, I've got an example here. Um, from the one of the chapter starters. It's one of my favourites. Uh, it's where we have um, Harry and Megan um, when they visited Australia earlier last year. Um, and it discusses, um, we can see that it discusses um, the kinds of choices that consumers make based on um, the influence of celebrities and social media influences. Um, this is something that our students are all really familiar with, um, but the extent to which they will have thought about it deeply um, is questionable, which is why we have uh, a making thinking visible um, exercise there. Um, and that they can start to think about the kinds of questions that they that they have about the topic. Um, so this is operate, this is um, intended to operate as a bit of a hook at the start of each topic um, to get them really interested in, in the chapter and generate discussion. Um, there are lots of different, like it's basically to flesh out the prompts that were provided um, at the start of each chapter. So they get a bit of an idea of what they're going to be learning about um, and what interests them about what they're going to be learning about. Um, there are, these can be used by teachers in a multitude of ways. Um, they're embedded throughout the series, so not just at, in these um, starter sections. Um, they can be used to introduce a topic, like here with the compass points, um, to get students to analyse an image, or for example, the image uh, above here. Um, we can get them to work in pairs or groups um, to encourage students to craft a written response. Um, or, to, or to get them engaged in debate, depending on how, how lively your cohort is. Um, by using the same routines sort of over and over, students can develop a real familiarity with them um, and confidence with the rules of the activity. It's also something that's consistent across the four topics um, covered in the series. So it really helps to tie the humanities and social sciences together in that way as well. Um, they are embedded in each chapter. Um, the authors were given really, really free reign to include them where they thought they could be um, useful. Uh, that said, you can absolutely adapt them to different scenarios depending on your class or the thinking routines that you're more comfortable with or think that your class would enjoy. Um, the authors have used the, each of the routines in different ways depending on the chapter content. Um, so they are included, here's an example of where it's included in the middle of a chapter. Um, it's also included at the end of um, each chapter. So the idea is that hopefully students will become familiar with these routines and engaged by them. Um, ideally, um, these activities get students to think more deeply about the material that they're accessing and articulate their thinking in a way that will um, Give them access to, to metacognition, excuse me, um, which hopefully leads to deeper understanding of the content and more authentic learning. Um, look, they're considered a, a tried and true um, series of teaching strategies that have been proven to work time and time again. Um, they really are, like we know that um, making thinking visible is a powerful tool. Um, they have been around for a little while. 
Um, so embedding them in the chapters and at the end of the chapters, um, we hope is uh, is another tool that you'll be able to add to your toolbox as a teacher. Um, here's another one at the end of the section review. Um, another think pair share, which is of course um, something that that many of you will have done already, um, but to have it there, I think, especially for new teachers, might help give you a bit of confidence. Or if you're not, or if you're not as familiar with the content material, um, look, at the end of the day, we really hope that you like the approach that we've taken, um, and that you, your students find that these activities um, to be really approachable, uh, and that it helps develop their engagement with and understanding of the chapter content. Um, it's been lovely speaking to you and please don't hesitate with questions at the end. G'day everyone, my name's Adrian and I'm the lead author for the geography component of this series and I'm here today to talk to you about how the series can be used to help students develop geographical skills throughout year 7 through to year 10. So firstly I'll pose a question to you and, and that is what is the best way to teach geographical skills? In my opinion a really important thing is to expose students to a range of different data types and different analysis skills throughout each year level and to make sure there's a balance in these skills between hands-on things like traditional forms of, of map analysis but also the use of, of spatial technology to assist with that. Data and the skills need to be relevant to the topics being studied. This helps students to understand both the skills but also um, the content and these skills should increase in complexity as students develop from year 7 through to year 10. Also highly recommend that, that scaffolding should be included where appropriate to support students who may have some difficulties with some of the skills. And a really important point is not to just teach skills for the sake of teaching skills. This makes geography incredibly boring and unnecessary. The whole point here is the skills should help us to understand the content. So they should be applied where the content is and presented in text as opposed to some other textbooks where they have a, a geographer's toolkit chapter that often tempts some teachers to run a, a one or two week skills um, unit. It's completely unnecessary as long as the skills are actually embedded in, in the topics, which is what we've done in this series. So some ideas of, 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 some, of the, um, some of the skills and data that we've included. Here in year seven, for example, this is just a snapshot. We have uh, different types of line graphs that can be used for comparison. In this particular one, it's about water storages in Melbourne. Segmented bar charts, pie graphs, um, stacked line graphs, which are quite complex, um, and tables of data where students might have to order the information or calculate averages or percentages. Also, a, a range of different types of maps and, and other graphs, such as climate graphs, um, rainfall maps here, elevation data, other sorts of choropleth maps, and satellite images are also quite common, in particular, to help um, students to, to see changes over time. In Year 8, in the Changing Nations chapter, we have some other types of data. Um, this graph is particularly great, I think, where you've got um, the urban population and the rural population, and students can see where they meet, and they can see what's happening in the future, and, and continue the projection if they wish, and have a look at what um, it may look like in 2050 or 2100. And on top of that, we have the world population as well. These sorts of scatter graphs are excellent and um, there's links to um, some websites where students can um, put in their own variables and have a look at the relationship, for example, between urban population and GDP per capita, GDP per capita, and see as the urban population increases, um, GDP per capita also tends to increase. These sorts of um, migration maps are excellent as well, so students can see where students, where people are moving from and where they're moving to. This particular one's focusing on internal movements within China, but there's also another map having a look at international migration as well. Some other types of data that year eights might see are things like, um, here we've got a choropleth map of the urban population, and overlaid onto that is the size of cities. So people, um, students can see not only which areas have the highest urban population, but also whether that urban population is confined to large cities such as megacities, or just spread more evenly over smaller cities. Cartograms, where students can see um, uh, areas exaggerated to represent um, the data that's in, in the legend. And here we have natural population growth and we have urban population growth rates. And students can have a look at the spatial association between these maps and see whether or not natural population growth is having a, a, a major or a minor impact on 
urban population growth rate. And another type of mapping skill that we have a look at is the change in distribution over time. So here's the same variable, having a look at it in 1950, 1990 and 2015, and students can track how that's changed in this case, the proportion of people living in urban areas. Throughout the um, chapter, we have all that data within the text and we have these things called developing geographical concepts and skills. So this is where it explains what the skill is. So in this case, describing what the special association actually means and then giving some pointers or some scaffolding in this case, um, showing students how to answer that type of question. So we also have how to describe a, a spatial distribution, drawing and interpreting line graphs, population pyramids, thematic maps, stack line graphs, bar graphs, gap minder where they can have a look at the association between variables. And that's just a snapshot. Plenty of these sorts of things throughout each of the year levels. Year 10, the data gets a little bit more complex. So here we have an example of the water cycle, but much more detailed than the version of year seven. Here we have, a, I guess, a process diagram, having a look at um, mangroves and the impact that has on an environment. Um, stack line graphs once again. This particular graph is fantastic. This looks at the temperature range and the precipitation range for different types of environments around the world, relevant to year nine biomes, but also year 10 environmental change and management. And population pyramids, students learn how to analyze these in terms of their overall shape, indentations, bulges, have a look at the aging population, the young population. And in the year 10 chapter, they apply this to the well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And this graph's fantastic at, at comparing a quite a stark inequality issue between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And I'll take the, this opportunity to say that each of the year levels um, has at least one case study having a look at Indigenous um, Australians, whether that be traditional forms of land management or well-being. So students definitely get good coverage over um, Indigenous issues. In Year 10, students often um, get the opportunity to have a look at some more complex types of maps as well. Um, topographic maps are used throughout the series. And here's another example of a unique type of map. In this case, it's the health of different um, study points, study areas along the Yarra River from the Yarra Reservoir to Melbourne and students can have a look at how, how the health of that water quality varies. Another really important part of our series and a really important part of teaching geography in, in, in modern times is the use of spatial technology. So spatial technology, it does scare some teachers and they think, oh, how do, um, am I doing this right? All it basically is, is any form of technology that refers to space and place. And so, Spatial technologies, they collect data, they organise data, and they reference that data to any point on the Earth's surface. Sometimes the data is organised in layers and um, manipulated using some sort of an online mapping portal. And when that happens, it's called a geographic information system. So that's one of the types of spatial tech that's included in the series. We also have um, satellite imagery and how to analyse that, other types of online, online mapping portals, and even things like digital elevation models showing... Um, um, bathymetry of the of ocean, um, ocean floor, but also of the landscape, digital elevation models and maps as well. So as an example, in year seven, we have a look at National Geographic Map Maker, where students can turn different layers on to a base map and zoom into different extents and have a look at the associations between variables. Year seven, they also have a look at a Brisbane flood map portal, where they can select the different um, level of flood risk and have a look at the spatial extent that that might have when it, when it floods. Having a look at um, satellite imagery and having a look, this is Dubai in 1984 versus Dubai at the moment, and having a look at the extent that the urban growth has, has occurred and showing students how to use the ruler tool and the polygon tool to actually quantify that urban growth. Having a look at census data and how that can be arranged spatially using a, um, a map portal called National Map and using that to answer some, some demographic questions. And in year 10, having a look at um, Global Forest Watch, which is quite a um, complex source of data, having a look at tree cover gain, tree cover loss, but also the ability to click on different countries and get a range of um, analysis and data options. So there's quite a wide range of spatial technology types covered. And in each case, it explains what it actually is. It gives students some steps to follow and then some questions to answer. So hopefully that gives you a brief snapshot of the um, different types of data and skills included in the series. And I look forward to your questions at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. I wanted to just spend the next few minutes or so going over some of the conceptual underpinnings of the Victorian curriculum 
and how that can be represented in works like the Cambridge Humanities text that we've been working on over the last little while. So focusing specifically on history, which is my expertise, uh, my area of expertise, the Victorian Curriculum for History identifies five different key concepts that are necessary for students to develop their ability to think historically. So as you can see here, these five are sequencing chronology, using historical sources as evidence, identifying continuity and change, analyzing cause and effect, and determining historical significance. Now, chronology, our first concept, concept that is listed there, involves the arrangement of events in order of time. However, it's not an end in and of itself. Uh, and by doing that, it allows students to be able to identify patterns and sequence the flow of events to be able to make links between events um, that are in the chronology that they are studying. The second one we have there, using historical sources as evidence, really does underpin sort of everything that we do in history. And it really focuses on the fact that sources are the building blocks of historical thinking and what makes studying history studying history. And it's about developing students' understanding and interpretations of the past. But students, it's not just about reading, students have to ask analytical and evaluative questions of sources so that they can be used as evidence when creating their own explanations about what they think happened in the past. These questions could be about identifying the origin of certain sources, the features or the purpose that these sources originally had. Our third one there, identifying continuity and change, involves developing students' ability to make sense of the past, including things that changed and things that continued unchanged as well. Our fourth concept, is about identifying the causes and the consequences and effect of events. These can be short or long-term causes or effects. Uh, they can be political, social, or economic. And we know that uh, complex events in history often have multiple causes and multiple effects, all of which vary in how big of an impact they had on the area that we're actually looking at. And then finally, determining historical significance. So historical significance concerns the particular aspects of the past we're studying and making evaluative judgments. These might be the judgments about the effect that the event had on certain groups of people or altering the course of uh, wider events in the chronology. It does depend on the questions that you are asking. Now, in the text that we've written for Cambridge University Press, uh, we focused on making sure, firstly, that historical sources, as using historical sources as evidence, uh, really did underpin everything that we did here. So one of the things that you'll notice if you look through is that whichever history chapter you're looking at, using historical sources as evidence is always present as an area that students focus on to develop their historical reasoning in this way. So this is a part of from the Year 7 textbook, uh, which introduces students to this concept. And as you can see here, it introduces students to the idea that there is different kinds of sources, like primary and secondary sources, and what are the key features of these sources. But what we also uh, found was a useful approach was that for each unit, uh, that we look at, that it focuses on some of the other concepts as well. So for example, here is Unit 1, which just uh, focuses on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and cultures. And as you can see here, this introduces students to that, uh, that concept of sequencing chronology here. So uh, what it means and how it might be useful. And as the text uh, progresses, for example, in Unit 2, where you can study either Egypt, Greece, or Rome, all three of those uh, options within that unit focuses on different concepts and the same for the third unit when looking at China or India. But what we've ensured that is as students go through whichever options they do, Egypt, Greece, or Rome, or India or China, that they are exposed to learning opportunities for all of the different concepts uh, that are present there. So this, for example, is how the Victorian curriculum uh, focuses on, I've just picked chronology, 
as the concept sequencing and this is from the year seven are uh, the level seven and eight descriptors with the elaborations but as you can see just focusing on the descriptor sequencing events are significant events in chronological order to analyze the causes and effects and identify continuities and changes and you see there some of the links between the concepts that chronology feeds into things like continuity and change and cause and effect and then beneath that, describe and explain broad patterns of change over a period from the ancient to the modern world. So really demonstrating there that simply sequencing events in chronological order is the beginning, not the end of how this concept gets used. So let's look at a couple of examples of how this actually plays out. So here's an example that comes and the examples I'll use today are from the year seven chapter on first Australian history. So we've got here a activity box from that which focuses on this concept and skill of sequencing chronology here. And as you can see here, it says a key still skill all historians need to have is how to put events in the order that they happened. When you do this, it's easy for you to see patterns and detect how things have changed over time. So really showing here that close link between what we've written here in the text and the curriculum, the Victorian curriculum here. So the student actions here, create a timeline from what you've read so far, and this is really the beginning information about migration, first Australian migration to the continent, looking at how that uh, developed over time. And it says here, uh, from the information in the timeline at the start of the chapter, make sure you outline the key phases that Sahul, the, the supercontinent there, went through tens of thousands of years ago. So again, making that link back to the curriculum that chronology is useful for identifying phases of time. If we look down at uh, the second and the third actions for the students to do, so question two, use the timeline you've created to write a short paragraph that explains the phases that the, the Sahul continent went through. So again, use of those chronological models like a timeline in order to be able to infer and understand things like phases within history, phases of time. If we look at the last action here for students, describe the impact these changes might have had on Torres Strait Islander peoples and cultures, uh, Islander peoples living during those times. So again, looking at the idea that these changes had causal impacts on people. So just like the curriculum identified, there's links here going forward. If we look at the other, so for this chapter, this first chapter of year seven, it's obviously focusing on chronology, but as all the history chapters do, it focuses on the idea of using historical sources as evidence. And so here's a um, activity for student activity from just later in that chapter. This uh, requires the use of both the information that they've read through, but also the use of this visual source, this wonderful painting here from Joseph Lysett. And it gives contextual information to this particular visual source. So Joseph Lysett was born in England in 1774, an artist who specialized in painting landscapes. Lysett was transported to Australia as a convict, arrived in Sydney in 1814. So this is providing students with all that contextual information to understand the origin of this. Um, after he was pardoned, he painted several famous scenes showing the cultural activities of Aboriginal peoples. Then it's got obviously the image here, and then it has two student activities here. The first one was the artist who painted source 1.15. So who was, that should be, the artist who painted source 1.15. How might this answer the question? How might the answer to this question, sorry, affect the ways the events were painted? So the fact that he is European means that students are beginning to understand that he, because he's not of the first Australian cultures, he is looking at it as an outsider and beginning to infer how that affects how he represents these things. And you've got here using the information. Uh, you have read and the painting explain how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples used fire to help them hunt animals for food. And there's a lot of contextual information in this section of the textbook, which they need to link in then to the source. So providing context for the source and making that link between them, that's there. And as it says here, please refer to the specific parts of the painting in your answer. And so just to sort of end this brief explanation here, a lot of the, the curriculum itself and how we've written a lot of the work here in the textbook is based a lot of long, uh, based on a lot of work from historical thinking research. So uh, you may be familiar with work of Canadian researcher 
uh, Peter Satius and that really great book he wrote with um, Tom Morton on the big six historical thinking concepts. Then also some other work that comes here from people like Stefan Levesque and Sam Weinberg and others here. These influenced how the curriculum was taught and then we uh, cur the curriculum was constructed and then how also uh, we went about the construction of this student resource to really try and make it based on the best research in this area. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ben Hoban. I am one of the contributing authors to the Cambridge Humanities Victoria series. I'm a teacher of 12 years teaching history at Cheltenham Secondary College here in Melbourne. And I have contributed to the year eight book and the year 10 book writing history chapters in both. So I'm here to do two things today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work I've done in the Year 10 book, but then also talk to you mostly about the digital resources that have been created here by the team. Hopefully you've had a bit of a look through the tour and seen some of the amazing things on offer. But I want to give you a bit of a teacher's perspective on how that is going to make your job a lot easier and a lot more engaging with your students. So before I get into the digital resources and content, the Cambridge team have asked me just to quickly discuss some of the work I did for Cambridge Humanities Victoria 10, principally the chapter on World War II and the section on the Holocaust. Now, as many of you know, uh, the Honourable James Molino said earlier in this year that teaching of the Holocaust should be compulsory in all Victorian schools. We all do it but obviously they have mandated this. So one of the things I'd like to draw your attention to is how we decided to approach this chapter and why I think it's gonna be a little bit different and perhaps a little bit more advantageous than uh, perhaps previous textbooks. So one of the first things I did when beginning this chapter was to reach out to Lisa Phillips at the Jewish Holocaust Center in Melbourne and basically asked for their guidance and assistance in writing the chapter and permission to use the stories of their survivors within it. They were an incredible help and unbelievable resource and provided incredible assistance in reviewing the chapter and making sure the story was told properly. But principally what we have done with this chapter is use the stories of four survivors who work with the Jewish Holocaust Center and have spent decades telling their stories there. So Irma Hummer, John Chaskiel, Willie Lerma, and Louisa Haberfield appear throughout the chapter. In many instances, they have direct experience of some of the more um, prominent events in the Holocaust, and they provide a first person account to things that I think traditionally we've taught that are hard to penetrate because of some of the most uh, challenging statistics and challenging stories. So hopefully you'll find that really really useful all of their stories are also available online at the jewish holocaust center and many of those uh, survivors are still available to tell their stories too so hopefully you can utilize that chapter to your advantage and i hope you really enjoy it all right on to the digital content so hopefully you've had a tour around the interactive textbook we'll have another quick look at that in a moment but what i want to do first is draw your attention to some of the support materials that you can get your hands on for each textbook that's really going to save you a lot of time so as a teacher we all know the one thing we don't have a lot of is time and one of the great advantages of each of these books is they provide a huge range of support materials that's just going to make your job a lot faster and a lot easier one of the few things I point your attention to, of course, is the PowerPoints that support the chapters. Now, these are really, really useful resources that take you through the PowerPoint, which you can use in class. They're ready-made. You can adjust them and make them your own as you go. But this is, of course, as we know, one of those things that always seems to take a long time to prepare. What this also means, too, is that you've got a consistent resource across all of your classes. If you're like me and you come from a big school where there's multiple uh, history classes across each year level, the one thing you really strive for in your team is consistency. So obviously then one of the other things that I've noticed too at my school at Cheltenham is we have people who are really specialists in geography or people who are specialists in uh, business and they're asked to teach history. So one of the other things that's supported are things like the teaching plan and the teaching tips and the suggested responses. And these are absolutely fantastic life-saving materials if you're not confident with that particular area. So each of these goes through question by question, what should be a good response and what to look out for and things to basically, you know, 
be ready for when teaching these topics in classes. So for graduate teachers, for teachers who are returning to history or teachers who perhaps don't have the same level of confidence, this is provided for every subject across the books. So this is a really, really wonderful resource. Added to all of that, of course, are the self-assessment checklists and the questions which we'll get into right now. All right, so what I'd like to do now is just walk you through some of the digital tools. Now you've seen these in the instructional video already, but there are some really great advantages with all of these tools that are gonna make a teacher's life a lot, lot easier. So as you've seen with the support materials, within each of the interactive textbook tasks, there are quizzes and review sections attached to that. So the quizzes are fantastic for obviously generating sort of summative understandings, but also formative understandings. And all of these can be downloaded and generated into reports, which I'll get to in a little bit. But one of the great advantages of the review section is that if you're looking at some of the more challenging tasks like interpretation or argument or the extension tasks, we know in the history classroom that teaching to write for history is itself a distinct skill. And one of the best ways we can do that, and one of the most high impact ways we can improve student outcomes is by modeling responses. So when students write their responses in, they can check the answer and it will give them a fully fleshed out response that they can look at before they attempt to do it themselves. It is of course up to you whether or not you show them to them, but these are really, really advantageous ways that we can improve our students' capabilities. All right, so one of the other things that I'm really excited about in this section and in the dashboard is the reports function, which is something that allows you to generate reports based on the work that the students do in the interactive textbook. So as you would have seen in the, the walkthrough, it generates really, really detailed reports on how students complete each section. And that is data that you can use to do formative and summative assessment and planning and reviewing your curriculum for the year. Uh, I work at a school that's really, really data driven, and this is a resource that's gonna make our jobs a lot easier to do and a lot less time consuming. So I'm really excited about the ability to do that, not only within this section, but across the faculties as well. So that's a tool that's gonna to be really excellent and a real time saver. All right, so the last thing I wanna to talk to you about is the resources that are available here. So at the beginning, I spoke to you about some of the resources in terms of teaching plans and suggested answers and PowerPoints and all of the ways that you can kind of speed up your preparation and be ready for each class. One of the great things we've provided in this series in under the teacher resources is a series of tasks that address the Victorian Curriculums Capabilities Project. So each school approaches this very differently, but what we've provided here are ready to go assessment tasks to make sure that you're hitting all of your reporting needs. And if you have those students who are really excelling or really extending or a student that perhaps needs a different task, these are great little tasks that allow the students to approach the subject in a different way and develop those capabilities. So what you'll notice with each one, it has a set task that they need to complete, but then added to that, there's a rubric that allows you to pick up, assess it and report on it in quick time. So hopefully that's something that's going to make your life a lot easier. I know it's going to make mine a lot easier as well. Thank you for your attention. I really hope you guys enjoy this series as much as I did contributing to it. I'll see you soon. Thank you everyone for those great presentations. Let me go to the next slide. I just want to run through. It's not working for me. There we go. I just want to run through um, the availability of our new series. So you've got on your screen there the purchasing options and the pricing. But just to let you know, um, we have Year 7 that's going to be published in early October. Our Year 8 book will be at the end of October. We'll also have um, Year 10 at the end of October. And at the moment, we've got Year 9 in stock. So that's available now. Please do get in touch with your um, Cambridge rep um, if you would like to receive further information on the series. We can provide you with um, sample pages to view. Um, we can provide you with further digital presentations to help with your book list decision making if need be. Um, it's now time to um, invite our presenters back on screen if they could turn their video and audio on. 
um, for question time. Um, I think I need to stop sharing mine, don't I? Sorry about that. Um, and I also would like to introduce you to our um, humanities publisher, Nick Alexander. He's also going to join the question time. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Emma. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, all right, we might start with a question uh, for you, Adrian. Uh, this is from uh, registration. So uh, how do we get, how do teachers get the leadership in their schools to view subjects like history and geography as a practice, uh, as in the subject areas of science, rather than just pure content consumption? Well, I certainly see geography as, as a science personally. I know it's part of a humanities as well, but I did it as a science background. And I think a big part of that for geography is certainly um, field work. And I didn't mention field work, but field work is a big part of our books. Every, every geography unit has an example of, um, of a field trip that students could go on, either as a class or, or some individual activities. And I think the other important thing is, is once again, the skills. It's the critical thinking and the analysis skills that the students will develop. And in particular, at the end of each chapter and, um, and throughout the chapter as well, in the review sections, there are opportunities for some really good extended response questions where students can analyse all sorts of data from within the chapters, do some individual research as well and learn to really construct an opinion. So many of the questions um, are based on uh, suggesting a factor, suggesting an impact and justifying that. And I think the justification of that is where um, geography and history really come into their own as, as really important disciplines. Mm. Oh, thanks. Um, Ash or Michael, would you have anything to add on history on that uh, topic? Ash, would you like to go first? Um, I would only say that it's it, in order to approach the teaching of history, if, they, if people are viewing it just simply as content consumption, you perhaps have to draw their attention to the fact that so many of the problems that we face as a country and, and perhaps the world have really deep historical context to them, that students need to get a really good understanding of if they're going to be the people who help solve them. If we look at problems like um, first Australian disadvantage across this country. Well, I think it's a little bit flippant to say, well, you know, they're just studying content when they're studying Australian history. They're studying the context of the world that we live in. And uh, I would really put forward an argument that we are empowering them as citizens of the future to understand the context of their world. Um, to do that. That's what I would say anyway. No, thank you. Um, okay, we've got a question here from Lisa Dempster. Uh, have we considered adding virtual geography excursions within the text? Um, Adrian, would you like this one? <laughs> um, yeah, not virtual in the sense of something completely in interactive, but certainly there are um, opportunities for, for Google Earth and, and there's some, um, some specific instructions to do um, several things on Google Earth. Um, I think there's also a virtual field trip uh, in the Year Nine section, which was not my not my chapter, but um, definitely plenty of case studies that provide imagery, map, all the data that you would need in order to to do that. But um, no, it's something completely interactive, not at this stage. One thing I'll just add that we do have is every uh, chapter has a Google Earth tour uh, in the interactive version, so. Uh, that's just designed to give a little bit of geographical context, but um, maybe not to the extent that Lisa would be after, but hopefully it's still something that students enjoy. Um, here's another question from registration. Uh, what kinds of hands-on engaging activities uh, have we included for teachers for year seven and eight history? Um, I might give, hand this one to Ben. Uh, okay, um, I can speak to, uh, there were two chapters that I did in year eight, which were the medieval and Aztec chapters. And there's a lot of opportunity to sort of do, um, I guess, your creative responses, your mapping tasks, your things that aren't traditionally um, history techniques. But one that, uh, one that comes to mind, I definitely really enjoyed putting in the debate about in the Aztec chapter about um, La Malinche, who was basically 
the sort of concubine slash wife of uh, Hernan Cortes, who was the explorer who conquered uh, the Aztec Empire. And one of the things that I did at the end of that chapter was to get kids to actually kind of stand up behind their learnings and develop an activity that asked kids to really debate, um, I guess, the ethical dilemma facing La Malinche and the issues that she had, um, perhaps either in betraying her people or perhaps doing what she needed to do to keep her own people alive. So in that process, um, I designed an activity that definitely gets kids to not only kind of, I guess, stand up behind their learning, but collaborate in groups and get them up and moving. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a history teacher, but I'm also also a media studies teacher. So I'm very used to kind of um, developing activities that really explore uh, kids with different areas of expertise. So allowing creative talents, allowing spoken tale, oral learning to find its way into the book. And that's probably uh, an activity that comes to mind that definitely is in medieval as well, um, along with a lot of the sort of, I guess, um, as Michael would say, canon activities that we find in medieval as well. I think there's lots in the um, making learning visible activities as well, as far as sparking class debate, getting kids up and moving around the room and that sort of thing that um, each of the authors have, have embedded in those history chapters too. Thanks, Jen. Um, another question here from registration. Um, how does the Year 10 book uh, tie in with the descriptors mentioned in the curriculum? Uh, I might just say that the series is structured uh, very closely against the Victorian curriculum and uh, each subsection of each chapter covers a content descriptor. But um, Ash, would you like to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, well, hopefully... Um... Uh, some of the presentations really gave insight into this that we we started with the curriculum and then built out from that about what the series would look like to make sure that we were covering all the elements of the curriculum that students are expected to learn and develop from as they progress. So we went when we were writing our um, our areas, we had lists of the curriculum content descriptors and the elaborations that went with it to make sure that we were covering all the relevant areas as we went through and uh, as we reviewed it towards the end and the lead authors went through and reviewed the different chapters making sure that every area was addressed so i, I don't think there's any area that uh, we will have missed out on which should be good for curriculum compliance no thank you um, and hopefully those victorian curriculum capabilities projects included with each chapter or another um, good tool for teachers. Um, just a final question from the registration, uh, which is a really good question. How can students learn about black swan events and develop the ability and skills to recognise unknown unknowns? And of course, uh, this is a crazy time we're living in. Um, I might just mention that we are planning to add a a chapter on COVID-19 uh, in each year level in the digital versions um, and we'll have those ready uh, by next uh, next year first term we're waiting for <laughs> events to pass um, but yeah Ben would you like to uh, tackle this question I'll mute myself um... Yeah, that is a really tricky one. I know it's something we discussed, especially in reference to uh, COVID and um, even looking at the plague. And that's something that we're actually doing in my classrooms at the moment, or my virtual classrooms. And it's um, in terms of how to approach it at, at this point in time, it's, it's a difficult one because uh, COVID is definitely, as you said, ongoing. And it's quite interesting getting feedback from my kids about how they're feeling about this particular situation. And how you approach things like the plague and make those comparisons and, and kind of look at those events in a different light. It'll be really interesting to kind of teach that uh, going forward and how students respond to that. But um, yeah, that's kind of a tricky one, Nick. I'm not sure about that. We need to wait. <laughs> I'd say that there's some interesting opportunities to look at events. Or if we look at the history perspective, there are so many events which were unexpected to the people of the time that you know hindsight makes 
a lot of things look a lot clearer. But if you look at uh, just the end of the, the Cold War, such as the collapse of the Soviet Union in the Year 10 text, that was quite shocking at ha- how quickly it happened at the time. But, you know, as uh, historians, we've, we developed an ability to, to look back and look at all those underlying causes and how the event really sort of, the underlying causes exacerbated those certain events. And so hopefully what one of the things it's able to do is to get students to be able to look at events currently and look beyond the immediate into what are really sort of longer term and underlying sort of uh, pressures that are going on and how that could play out. Um, That, you know, you can't, you know, the unknown unknowns, you can't predict, but you can get a better understanding of the, of stresses and, you know, pressures in the system that uh, events can exploit. Michael, would you like to add anything on on that question? So yeah. the the question was in the current climate, how do teachers prepare students uh, to uh, recognise the unknown unknowns that are out there? Uh, yes, I wanted to go back to the the previous question as well about how you convince uh, uh, principals that uh, history and the humanities are important. Um, speaking in this time of crisis. Uh, and uh, when I wrote a little bit of an introduction to one of the books, I was reflecting on the fact that uh, it's, it, there is a tendency to think that history and the other humanities subjects are quaint antiquarian pastimes, not relevant to science and technology. Science and technology, of course, are going to be massively important in the way we um, deal with the current crisis and deal with future ones. But what we're seeing around us now with the way people are behaving, the sovereign citizens refusing to wear masks and so on, um, I think that uh, people who are going to handle the crises of the future will be well equipped if they also understand how human beings and how human societies behave. Um, So uh, this current situation really shows that uh, we need to understand human society, not just the sciences. Thanks, Michael. Well, I think that's it for the uh, Q&A, unless there's any last uh, questions. So I'll hand back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Um, And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to our presenters. They all did a wonderful job. So thank you once again for joining us, um, and we hope to hear from you really soon. Thank you.